It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, my first question is to the Premier. You know, parents and students are nervously awaiting news about which schools will be closed tomorrow and hoping for news that will avoid job action. Can the Premier tell us what steps he's taken over the 120 hours since job action was first announced to avoid a shutdown of schools tomorrow? Question to the Premier. Minister of Education. And referred to the Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, for 204 consecutive days, the teachers' unions have made absolutely no moves to the bargaining table, notwithstanding that the government of Ontario has made significant moves from classroom sizes from 28 to 25 to online learning from four to two. Mr. Speaker, we are listening to those we are serving. However, every single uh, entity at the table must be reasonable in order to ensure we keep kids in class both Wednesday and every day thereafter. Our government is focused on getting deals because the parents of this province deserve predictability and children deserve educational stability on Wednesday and every day thereafter. The supplementary question. Well, Speaker, the government doesn't get credit for not cutting even deeper. Parents don't want them to cut at all. That's the problem. Yeah. To parents and students wondering what's going to happen to the school year, it looks like the Premier has been doing very little to fix the, uh, the mess that he's created. For months, the Premier did his utmost to pick a fight with uh, teachers right. in the classroom and ignore the concerns of parents and students who said his cuts would hurt the quality of our kids' education and create conflict. Now that we're on the verge of school school closures across Ontario, is the Premier ready to actually social show some leadership, de-escalate this situation, and reverse the reckless cuts? Questions are referred to the Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, the Premier has demonstrated his firm commitment in the defence of public education by increasing expenditure to the highest levels ever recorded in this province's history. Mr. Speaker, Every member of our team is committed to keeping kids in class. We demonstrated this consistent, student-centric focus at the table with QP. And with QP, we got a deal, a good deal for all parties. We seek to do that again for the teachers in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, what is constant through the process and what is frustrating for observers is that irrespective of the Premier and who's in the chair, the bottom line is uh, teachers' unions escalate against the government. And that is unacceptable for parents. It's what unites Order. Bob Ray and, and the former Premier, Premier McGinty and now Doug Ford. The unity there is that they all face escalation by unions, and I think parents are frustrated and sick and tired of it. What they want is every party to be reasonable. We're going to continue Response. to invest in education, get a good deal that keeps kids in class. The final supplementary. <laughs> well, I guess the, the minister doesn't get it, but cuts and rollbacks, those are escalation, Speaker. That's right. exactly. Protecting our public education, that's the way that the government should be going. That's what parents are saying anyways. And, and I don't know what the minister is looking at, but here's what parents see. A premier that spent months calling teachers thugs and blaming them when he was booed at public events. Yeah. A minister of education sure. who literally delayed bargaining so he could hold a press conference about the lack of bargaining. And a government that is still defending classroom cuts that mean larger class sizes, cancelled courses, and mandatory online learning. If the Premier wants to keep kids in the classroom, he could de-escalate this situation today by reversing his cuts. And the question is simple, why doesn't he? Members, please take their seats. Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, the Premier has demonstrated a firm commitment to improving education by putting more money in the system than ever before. He's committed to that because we've doubled the mental health envelope in this province. We've invested more to expand, to improve schools, a $550 million renewal to build new schools and improve existing schools. Mr. Speaker, we're putting a $200 million math strategy to lift math scores after they were uh, being firmly held at a low rate for 10 consecutive years. They've essentially stagnated. Mr. Speaker, the government is investing in our children. What we're also doing is asking every party at the table to be reasonable. Students should be in class tomorrow, and the government stands with them. And the question for the member opposite is, do you oppose escalation by teachers' unions who are keeping kids out of class tomorrow? 
The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Kindly. My, question, uh, my next question is also for the Premier. You know, yesterday the Minister of Education defended the government's decision to hide the results of their education consultation, a consultation which showed an overwhelming majority of parents oppose the government's plans for larger classes and mandatory online learning. For months, the Premier insisted he was on the side of parents, and he claimed they supported the cuts that now threaten to close schools all across Ontario. Why would he say that when he knew that his own consultation showed the exact opposite? Questions to the Premier? Minister of Education. Referred to the Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the government has consistently been reasonable at the table to incense the parties to stay there and to get a deal. We demonstrated this precise approach in negotiating with QP. And we got a deal that was good for students, good for parents, and good for the workers of this province. We seek to replicate that again with our teachers. For 204 consecutive days, there have been no material change, no change at all to the position of the unions. How is that an acceptable proposition for parents who want all the parties to be reasonable and who want the parties to be focused on keeping kids in class? The Premier has led by example by ensuring that my mandate is to keep kids in class. We are fighting every day at the table, 24-7, to keep kids in class where they belong. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, you know, the minister needs to know, and so does the Premier, that what parents see is the farthest thing from being reasonable in this situation. It's the yep. furthest thing from reasonable that you can get. But for months, the Premier insisted that parents backed his scheme for large class sizes, Speaker, mandatory online learning, and firing 10,000 uh, teachers. That's what they were claiming. Yet the government's own consultation showed that parents overwhelmingly disapprove with these moves, Speaker. This government is still hiking class sizes. This government is still forcing students into online learning that won't work for them and will not allow them to graduate with these mandatory requirements. Why would a government actually, uh, who actually listened to parents move ahead with what parents have clearly rejected, Speaker? Minister. On the contrary, Mr. Speaker, it's this government that is maintaining the lowest classroom size in the early years in this country. And that is a fact which the members Order. opposite choose to ignore. Mr. Speaker, we have listened to families, which is why we've made a decision to move the provincial average of classroom sizes from 28 to 25. It's why we've moved the online learning mandate from four to two. It's why we've improved and invested in frontline education. Mr. Speaker, what we have also heard consistently is the teachers' union's mandate or the insistence on a $1.5 billion increase in compensation. We're offering $750 million, and apparently that is insufficient. Mr. Speaker, my priority, the bias of this government, is to put more money in Order. the front of class to help our kids. That's what we're going to continue to do at the negotiating table and do everything we can, including turning to third-party mediation, to get a deal that keeps the children of this province in class. The final supplement. Well, Speaker, you know, here's a news flash to the Premier. Cuts that are less deep are still cuts that parents don't want to our public education system. That's the reality. The Premier spent months claiming he had the support of parents and students, yet parents and students have been crystal clear from day one, and they continue to be clear today. They don't support larger classes, mandatory online courses, or firing 10,000 teachers. So instead of working overtime to work with teachers and reach a deal to improve our public education system, the Premier has been making cuts, picking fights, and pretending that parents don't care about these cuts. When will the Premier stop defending his indefensible cuts and start working with teachers to reach a deal that works for kids, that works for quality public, public education in the province of Ontario. When will he do that? Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, our government supports a deal, not a strike. That's why we're working hard at the negotiating table to ensure that our education unions in good faith get a deal with us like we did with Order. QP just one month ago. Mr. Speaker, the objective of the government is to ensure that children, the continuity of learning for children remains unimpeded. And what is regrettable is that irrespective of the party or the premier, the one constant in my lifetime is that unions escalate against the government. That is an unacceptable reality. And I would think that all members Order. of this legislature would oppose escalation that hurts our kids. We stand with parents against escalation. We're going to work hard every day over the coming hours and days to keep kids in class and do everything we can to ensure the Order. continuum of learning is not impeded because of union escalation. The next question, 
Once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, my, my next uh, question is uh, to the Premier, but I don't know if the Minister noticed there's no parents standing with him. Seventy yeah. percent of them don't agree with him. Exactly. Yesterday, while the Premiers were calling for an increase in provincial health transfers, some were resisting the implementation of a universal pharmacare program. And sadly, it seems Ontario's Premier was the ringleader in that regard. At, this, at a time when families desperately need a Premier who will work on the national stage to build a pharmacare program, why is this Premier trying to undermine any effort to do so? Questions addressed to the Premier. Minister of Health. And referred to the Minister of Health. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the question because we are looking to solve problems that exist. One of the problems that exists right now in Ontario is that our drug escalation costs are going up 5% year over year over year. We need some assistance from the federal government on that, on rare and orphan disease drugs. It's wonderful that these discoveries are being made, but some of them are in excess of a million dollars per patient. That is something that, as Minister of Health, I take a full responsibility for. We want everybody to receive the medications that they need, but we need the federal government's assistance on this. We have a robust drug plan already in Ontario. We don't need assistance with that, but we do need assistance with rare and orphan disease drugs, and that's something that I intend to follow up with the federal health minister to uh, let her know uh, what our position is and to understand Boss. what the position of the other provinces and territories is. Thank you very much. Well, Speaker, I, I have to say I am shocked by that response. There are people in this province that can't afford their prescription drugs right now, that cut pills in half because they can't afford to renew their prescriptions at a timely fashion. And this health minister refuses to acknowledge that. This is a very serious situation, Speaker. Ontarians have already seen their health care system slashed by this government. And now the Premier is attacking a national pharmacare plan that can deliver that very real relief that everyday families need. At a time when people across the province are having to choose, as I said, between filling prescriptions and paying their bills, universal drug coverage is a crucial next step and families simply can't wait, nor should they have to wait, Speaker. Why is the Premier trying to torpedo prescription drug coverage right when Ontarians need it the most? Questions to the Minister of Health. Well, thank you. With respect, Speaker, I need to um, say to the Leader of the Official Opposition through you that we are actually increasing our coverage for health costs in the province of Ontario by $1.9 billion next year. That is a big, big increase. We already have a, quite a robust uh, health coverage system for people that need coverage. We also have the Trillium program for people that need extra assistance. However, what we do need help with is access to rare and orphan disease drugs. I've heard from many people about this. I know that the coverage issue is very difficult. It's very expensive. We want people to get that coverage. We want people with their rare and orphan disease issues to be able to receive that kind of care. That's where we actually we need the federal government's assistance, and that's what I'm going to pursue as Minister of Health. The next question, the member for Milton. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Premier, yesterday yourself, along with other Premiers, demonstrated the true essence of national unity and leadership by representing diverse regions and beliefs in support of the betterment of all Canadians. Here, here. Leaders from across this great nation gathered together to demonstrate a commitment to putting our country first. Premier, you said it best that although we might have our differences, Canada is united together. Premier, can you highlight some of the overlapping policies that all provincial leaders raised as requiring further support from the federal government in order for Canadians from across this country order. to be better served? Finally, the question is addressed to the Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank our great MPP from Milton. That's actually the hometown of my daughter. And she tells me everyone loves them over in Milton as well. So through, through you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we've never seen this country so divided after the last federal election. We had people from the West absolutely furious. We had Quebec with a bloc that uh, got elected to have the third largest uh, seats in, in the parliament there. It was divided. What a great visit when Premier Higgs came by and sat down, and I give all the credit for this meeting to uh, my good friend Premier Scott Moe from Saskatchewan. 
that felt that this was a time to bring the country together, to bring the country together through the premiers, to make sure we, we just lower the heat. We lower the heat amongst all the provinces and the federal government. I know how much they appreciated the meeting. Response. After the meeting, uh, Mr. Speaker, we are a divided nation. We are a nation that's united right now, and we'll continue being united. Because when we're united, there's no. Thank you very much. Thank you. The supplementary question. Order. 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 Restart the clock. Supplementary question. Thank you. Thank you, Premier, for that answer, for your commitment and leadership in standing up for the people of this great province. Yeah. Premier, I know in particular you have been a champion for the Canadian economy, taking a leadership role on this front, highlighting the dangers of instability and economic isolation will have on this country. As you have said previously, what is good for Ontario is good for Canada and vice versa. You have said that provinces should be competing together against the world and not against each other. Premier, can you share with this House the importance of economic growth and the measures that were agreed by all provinces? Great question. Premier. I want to thank our MPP from Milton for that great question. There was a few items, uh, Mr. Speaker, that we condensed down to about four different items that had the concerns of all provinces across this, this great nation. One being economic development, job creation. And I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, we're leading North America in economic development, job creation because of the policies of our government. We're leading the nation, we're leading North America with 200 and 252,400 jobs. There's 252,000 more families putting food on the table, paying rent, paying mortgages, and doing things they might otherwise not be able to afford. Our economy is booming. We're the envy of Canada and North America. We, we also uh, spoke about the transfers, Mr. Speaker. Nothing's more important Order. in this country than health, 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 Spons. jobs, jobs, jobs. We asked for an escalator to go up from 3 percent to 5.2 percent, Mr. Speaker, which will take of the burden off the provinces, because I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, we can't do it alone when it comes to health care. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question, the member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my question is to the Premier. Uh, first, let me say that nothing that the Minister of Education has said here today will give Ontario families an ounce of assurance that schools will be open tomorrow. The government says they're being reasonable when it comes to their escalating attacks on our school system. But let's take stock for a moment of what they're offering our next generation. They're still planning to fire thousands of teachers. They're still planning to replace in-person instruction with risky, mandatory, Alabama-style learning, and they're still planning to cram more kids in fewer courses. Mr. Speaker, does this sound reasonable? The question is addressed to the Premier. The Minister of Education. Referred to the Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, what our government is focused on is investing in the front lines of education. We have increased expenditure this year. We're on track to spend $1.2 billion more than we did last year, Mr. Speaker. That is a proof positive that we care deeply about the success of our young people. Mr. Speaker, when it comes to what we're doing to keep kids in class, we have asked our members opposite to stand with the government to look to third-party mediation, which worked with QP just one month ago. Yeah. We've heard silence. What we've told parents, what we have told parents is that the mission of the government is to keep kids in class by using every tool in the toolkit because parents should know with confidence that their kids yeah. should be in class tomorrow. What is regrettable is that there's not unanimity of purpose in the legislature opposing escalation. The yeah. silence seems to be almost implicit Order. support for these approaches, which we oppose. Our government is going Spons. to continue to work hard 24-7 to get deals so we keep kids in class. The supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I'm going to go back to the Premier. The Minister clearly needs a, a lesson in bargaining 101. You're supposed to go to the bargaining table to improve education, not make cuts that hurt kids. If this, if this government
government cared about our students, they wouldn't be asking them to foot the bill for their tax cuts and their costly court cases. They wouldn't be jeopardizing graduation rates by cutting courses and pushing kids into online learning. And they wouldn't be targeting the very people who deliver our education. As the clock ticks toward job action, will the minister finally do the right thing? Premier, take these unreasonable cuts off the table and stop these attacks on our kids' future. Minister of Education. Well, thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the member opposite speaks about data points. Will she agree that a $1.5 billion increase is too high when it comes to the offer we've proposed for educators, which is for $750 million? Mr. Speaker, the fundamental issue at the table is a lack of willingness to move off a $1.5 billion or commitment to increase compensation. It is a, it is a fundamental Order. contrast point at the table. The priority of this government and this Premier is to invest in education. Mr. Speaker, the 1 percent we're offering is Falls, dollars, which is somewhat similar to the $700 million increase made at the height of Liberal spending under the former government. Mr. Speaker, <laughs> we are committed to our kids. We're putting more money in math supports, more money in our special education at the highest levels in French. In, in, in mathematics support, in First Nations, in French language. Mr. Speaker, we're doing that because yeah. we believe in the potential of the young people in this province. Yeah. Thank you. The next question, the member for Don Valley West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, you know, Mr. Speaker, I understand that the Minister of Education is in a tough spot. I get that. It's a really hard place to be. But the fact is that the, the Labour action Order. that is in place right now is a direct result of this government's unwillingness to recognize that the cuts that are being imposed on the system are going to have implications. And Mr. Speaker, I've worked, I've worked as a parent activist with teachers. I've been the, an MPP. I've been the Minister of Education. I've been the Premier. And to a person, I know, Mr. Speaker, from that experience that there's nobody in our schools who want to be part of this conflict. They don't want the divisiveness. They know that it's problematic for them and their students. And also, Mr. Speaker, many, many of the students who are, many of the parents who are in our school community communities right now were children and students during the Harris years. They know, Mr. Speaker, what it's like to be out of school for weeks on end. They know what Question. the conflict costs, Mr. Speaker. So I say to the minister, Mr. Speaker, what exactly has the government done beyond continuing to stand by cuts? What has the government done in the last four days to try to get an agreement? To address the Minister of Education. Yes, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, what we have done is we've offered mediation as a, as a, as a reasonable offer to incentive the parties to stay at the table. We've offered independent mediation, the same mechanism this government used to get a good deal with QP that provided predictability yeah. for parents. Mr. Speaker, the request and the insistence of the teachers' union is clear. They want a $1.5 billion increase. Now, Mr. Speaker, I actually believe we should be remunerating our teachers well. They are at the front of class that we need to retain talent. They are the second highest remunerated in the nation. The preference of this government is to pour more money to help our kids. We are looking at every option possible to invest more in our children's future. That's the priority of students, it's the priority of parents, and it's the priority of this government. Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, I understand that the Minister of my question is the Minister of Education. I understand that the Minister of Education wants to claim that this is about compensation. What I have heard the unions and the federations say, Mr. Speaker, is that the quality of education is their focus. That's their primary focus. They know, Mr. Speaker, that the cuts to per pupil funding, the increase in class sizes, the ins insistence on mandatory online courses, that those continue to be disrespectful to children, disrespectful to parents, Mr. Speaker, and disrespect disrespectful to their teachers and support workers. It is up to the government, Mr. Speaker, to bring real solutions to the table. It is time for the government to bring real solutions, to work seriously to come to an agreement. Mediation can only work, Mr. Speaker, if there's willingness on both sides of the table. The government needs to bring real solutions to the table, Question. Mr. Speaker. Will the minister assure the students of this province that he is Order. going to do just that? Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, allow me to quote the member opposite. Mediation only works if all parties are reasonable. I agree for the first time in my history with the member opposite. Mediation only order. agrees if member all for parties Essex are come reasonable. To order. And what is unreasonable is that for 204 consecutive days, without interruption, there has been no material change at all to the position of OSSTF. How is that acceptable for parents? Every entity needs to be reasonable and put our kids first. What they are not doing is doing so. What they're providing is an insistent priority on a $1.5 billion 
billion dollar increase to compensation. That is unacceptable. We want the unions to be reasonable, to stay at the table, and work with the government in good faith to provide predictability for every child in this province. Order. The next question, the member for Chatham Kent Leamington. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> My question is for the Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries. Last month, the minister was able to visit Where Canada Begins during her tour of southwestern Ontario. Her visit included stops at local attractions as well as meetings with mayors and council members from Tecumseh and Windsor and the CEO of the local tourism organization serving Windsor, Essex and Pelee Island. The minister was also able to visit the folks from MH100 Teen Program, a successful program for at-risk youth in the area before ending her day at the Windsor International Film Festival, attended by approximately 1,200 cinema enthusiasts and industry professionals. It is clear there is much to explore across all of southwestern Question. Ontario. Can the minister please tell us how her ministry's support for attractions in my riding of Chatham Kent Leamington is growing the local economies and communities across southwestern? Thank you very much. The Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries. Thank you very much, Speaker. It's my pleasure to respond to the great member from Chatham, Kent Leamington. Uh, he has been a strong advocate in this House for many years for his community, and I'm glad to be addressing what we're doing in the Ministry of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries within his region. Uh, he's right. Last month, I had the opportunity to meet with uh, Mayor Drew Dilkins of, of uh, Windsor, Gordon Orr, who is the CEO of the local tourism, uh, Gary McNamara of Tecumseh and his, his uh, team, and Mahari Haigos from MH100, a young man who has built from absolutely nothing something that is so spectacular. We want to emulate uh, his involvement in sport and in, in uh, underprivileged areas right across the province. Uh, I did have the opportunity to go to the Winter International Film Festival, uh, where we invested over $50,000. It is the largest film festival uh, in terms of volunteers across the entire province. And speaker, They're doing great things there. I'm very proud of the work and the contributions that they are making. And we're going to continue to support the Windsor International Film Festival as well Response. as institutions within the members' constituency. Supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Speaker. That's wonderful to hear just how an array of industries in southwestern Ontario have such an important impact on our local jobs and tourism spending. <laughs> our region is lucky and proud to call itself a two-nation destination. Since our region is literally a neighbour to our southern neighbour, we benefit greatly from our American friends visiting our sites, assets and attractions. In fact, according to Destination Canada, during the second quarter of this year, visitors from the United States represented 52 per cent or $3.3 billion of all spending by international visitors. Can the minister please tell us what she is doing to reach new markets and encourage more international Question. visitors to explore what she likes to call a world in one province. Here, here. Mr. Heritage. Thank you very much, Speaker. The member is right. We do call Ontario the world in one province. You can explore and experience almost anything in this province, and we should be very proud of that. I'm also very proud of Windsor and the surrounding areas for their uh, marketing of being where Canada begins, literally embracing uh, tourists from across uh, across the border, and working, in fact, with uh, Detroit uh, on this two-nation destination. Let me tell you a little bit about Destination Ontario, that we're strategic strategically targeting markets to show how the potential for increased visitation and visitor expenditures, including the United States. In 2018, Destination Ontario and Destination Canada and our regional tourism organizations targeted markets in the United States, um, accessible by a short-haul flight, targeted with Ontario-specific content through major publishers, for example, the New York Times, the New Yorker and the Washington Post. With a combined investment of $2 million, this partnership generated 97,000 incremental trips to Ontario and approximately $59 million in visitors. Mr. Speaker, we are open for business, open for jobs, and we're open for visitors. Thank you. The next question, the member for Essex. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, last week the, uh, the Premier's normally wordy energy minister lasted all of about five seconds in a scrum with reporters when he finally stated that climate change is real and as a consequence of human activity. Then he bolted. 
shocking uh, all the journalists in the scrum. It would almost be believable, Speaker, if that same minister had not spent the rest of the week defending his passion for a website that specializes in climate change denial. Whether it's tearing up clean energy contracts to a tune of $231 million or putting up stickers that don't stick, it all points to the Ford government's belief that they can ignore the climate crisis. Speaker, why is the Premier stacking key government roles with people who can't even say whether climate change is real? Questions addressed to the Premier. Well, through, through you, Mr. Speaker, we've talked about this numerous times, and, and we, we believe climate uh, change is real. But even better, we have an incredible policy moving uh, forward to meet our target, the Paris Accord of 30 uh, percent. We're well on our way. We're actually going to exceed that uh, goal and, and focus on uh, making sure we have clean air, clean lakes, clean rivers, and making sure that we respect the, the environment. And do you know how we're doing that, uh, Mr. Speaker? Uh, the other day, yesterday, I made an announcement of SMRs, small modular reactors. That is the way of the future. It's going to create $10 billion in economic development, $150 billion of economic development globally. We know the, the, the Chinese and the Russians are, are playing in this arena. We're, we have the smartest and brightest people when it comes to nuclear uh, right here in Ontario, and we'll make sure that Lots. we take care, of those, take care of those jobs. We're also getting people out of cars, putting a $28 billion transit system together. That's the largest infrastructure project in transit in North America. That's Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, uh, last March, uh, the Energy Minister appointed his former Conservative colleague, Joe Oliver, as the chair of the Independent Electricity System Operator and charged him with handling Ontario's energy needs. It's a big job for a partisan appointee, but still Mr. Oliver has found some time on the side to denounce what he calls climate alarmists and even suggested, quote, let's not ignore the greater personal comfort of living in a more hospitable climate. Apparently, Mr. Oliver shares the same love of periodicals as the Minister of Energy does. Speaker, since this Premier has given him such a key role in shaping Ontario's energy future, does the Premier agree with Mr. Oliver about the potential benefits of climate change? And if not, why did he let his energy minister give him a key role in planning Ontario's electricity future? Premier to reply. Uh, through, through, through you, Mr. Speaker, I'm so proud of our Minister of Energy. He's an absolute all-star. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Energy has one of the toughest jobs down there, cleaning up the mess yeah. that the NDP and the Liberals created yeah, for this exactly. province, creating a mess that made us uncompetitive, gave us the highest hydro bills in North America. Yeah. We're finally getting our hands around the colossal mess. And I was reading the uh, Auditor General's report, Mr. Speaker, from 2006 to 2014. Under the NDP and Liberal regime, I said, there's never been a bigger transfer of wealth from the hardworking men and women and businesses and the ratepayers of this province under their regime. Order. The, the ratepayers paid a tune of $37 billion more than that what they should have. $37 billion in the right in the pockets of the backroom dealers of their cronies and the other cronies that support the Liberals. The next question. The member for Guelph. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. So the Premier is making a lot of noise about his government's so-called Made in Ontario Environment Plan, but expert analysts have said it's a made order. Expert. Stop the clock. Okay. You can't drown out the member for Guelph, such that he can't place his question. Order. Restart the clock. Member for Guelph. Thank you, Speaker. Expert analysts have said it's a made-to-fail plan. Economists and scientists have given it a failing grade. Environmental groups have said it's failed to launch, and now a group of young people are suing this government for its failure to act on the climate crisis. Yet the Premier continues to sabotage climate solutions while citing the 22% emission reductions achieved under the previous government. Well, Speaker, 22% is not good enough. So I ask the Premier if he can cite any action his government has taken to actually reduce GHG pollution in Ontario. 
question has been addressed to the Premier. Minister of Environment. Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank the member opposite for his question. I'm, I'm glad that you do have a plan for the environment, unlike our official opposition of this House, which is yet to table a plan to deal with climate change or the pollution. But, Mr. Speaker, I will have to say that uh, although we have reached 22 percent, we're leading uh, one of the leaders in the country at getting our emissions to 30 percent, which was the, the, the move, movement away from coal in our electricity sector was started by the last progressive Conservative government. We, we thank the Liberal government for following through and our, our initial movement towards removing coal. But, Mr. Speaker, we have made quite a bit of uh, steps towards uh, making our 30 per cent. This morning, I just announced our new dry clean program for heavy-duty trucks uh, this morning in North York. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, that is going to reduce the pollutants to start reducing the greenhouse gases in the transportation sector, which is one of the leading causes of greenhouse gases in this uh, province, Mr. Speaker. A supplementary question. Speaker. Vague platitudes will not solve the climate crisis. It will not solve the emergency that we face. As a matter of fact, delaying action is the new form of climate denialism. The bottom line is this government has at least one minister who enjoys reading climate denial literature. They've, canceled, they've wasted $30 million on stickers that don't stick, trying to sabotage solutions by suing the federal government. They've cancelled renewable energy contracts at a cost of $231 million at a time when renewable energy prices are dropping. Order. They've actually cancelled transit funding outside of Toronto by 40 per cent. So, Speaker, I asked the minister, can the minister tell the people of Ontario of at least one action? this government has done to reduce GHG pollution so that we can leave a livable planet for our children. The question has been referred to the Minister of Energy. Uh, Earth, thanks very Roger. much, Mr. Politics. Speaker. And, uh, just uh, the last month, uh, working with the Ministry of Energy, I approved the environmental approval so that they can move forward to start creating the uh, Wate Power uh, corridor up in the north that's going to remove the indigenous communities off diesel uh, energy production, Mr. Speaker, and give her clean energy production from clean sources. There's one. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we've laid the groundwork uh, with the Ministry of Transportation to electrifying our GO network, Mr. Speaker. That's going to pay benefits down the road of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Mr. Speaker, we've got a uh, historic announcement to build uh, four new subways in the city of Toronto, which is going to remove thousands, hundreds of thousands of vehicles off our roadways every day, Mr. Speaker. We've uh, implemented and we've asked the federal government had a great meeting with the federal minister of environment yesterday as we're moving forward together with our industrial performance standards. We're going to start Response. reducing the, in, in the emissions from industry, the heavy polluters of this, prov of this province. We're going to make sure they start lowering their emissions and they're going to pay for it if they don't, Mr. Speaker. We are doing much to lower the emissions of this province. We're going to... Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Mississauga Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the President of the Treasury Board. A little over a week ago, he made an announcement joined by dedicated nonprofit and community leaders. Nonprofits and other public sector partners have been asking the government for years to ease, ease administrative burdens. Mr. Speaker, I've recently met with representatives of Ontario non, non for Profit Network in my riding of Mississauga Centre, and they told me how excessive administration is taking up more and more of their daily work. After 15 years of liberal mismanagement and ill conceived planning, this situation did not improve. Ontarians expect and deserve better service from their government. That is why the President of the Treasury Board announced that our government will be consolidating transfer payment agreements to service delivery partners, reducing burdensome administration and allowing them to focus on the front lines. Through you, Speaker, could the uh, minister please explain how consolidation of government transfer payments will improve services for the people of Ontario? The question is addressed to the President of the Treasury Board. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I would like to thank the very hardworking member for Mississauga Centre for that question. Now, Mr. Speaker, as many people in this chamber know, 90 per cent of government spending is transferred to other people to provide the vital programs for Ontarians. And under the previous administration, uh, the Liberals, uh, many different ministries and systems and processes were used to deliver these tasks in a duplicative way. Mr. Speaker, you could often have a transfer payment agreement to seven different or eight different ministries, uh, 
making it very complicated for those who deliver these programs. Mr. Speaker, this in robs the ability to deliver those programs in a timely and efficient manner by simplifying and streamlining the profits, not only for municipalities, Spons. but also for not-profits uh, and per service providers who receive government funding. We are, ensure, we are ensuring that Ontarians get funding and more value for their taxpayer dollars, Mr. Thank you very much. <laughs> Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to thank the minister for his response and for being a champion for Ontario's taxpayers. By making sure that our public sector partners can focus more time and resources towards frontline services, our government is ensuring that Ontarians are getting better access to vital services for their taxpayer dollars. For example, our government has reduced the administrative burden for municipalities, delivering early child care programs by 50 per cent. This one example shows how transfer payment consolidation is a smart policy that will benefit service providers and Ontarians alike. Smart initiatives like transfer payment consolidation is exemplary of how we are building an efficient, effective and smart government together. Speaker, my question goes back to the President of the Treasury Board. Could the Honourable Member please explain what our non-profit partners think of our SMART initiative? Question. <laughs> President of the Treasury Board. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, I'd like to thank the champion from Mississauga Centre for, uh, for that question. Uh, transfer payment consolidation has been a long-standing request by recipients of uh, transfer payments because reducing red tape allows them to focus on what they do best, servicing the public, not paperwork. For example, the Ontario Not-Profit Network, an organization representing 58,000 not-profit entities in this province, spent over a decade trying to convince the previous government to make these changes. We're doing it. The organization said that the transfer payment reform, and I quote, is an important opportunity to modernize funding agreements so both nonprofits and governments spend less time on paperwork and more time delivering services that support Ontarians. Here, here. Speaker, our work with the Ontario Response. Nonprofit Network demonstrates that we are a government that listens, that delivers, and that's dedicated to building Ontario together. The next question, the member for Hamilton West, Ancaster Dundas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. Since news broke of the devastating environmental contamination of Coots Paradise in Hamilton, I have asked questions in the House about when this government learned of the spill. I wrote to you as Minister requesting full public disclosure, and I filed a Freedom of Information request related to this investigation. But what I have gotten back from this government is either, is either silence or attempts to shift blame away from the fact that this government chose to not disclose a significant environmental disaster to the people of Hamilton. The minister has said that an investigation is ongoing. And so, my question, will the minister commit to making the investigation's findings public so disasters like this never happen again? Question has been addressed to the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Thank, thanks very much uh, for that question opposite, Mr. Speaker. And I've, I've spoken that uh, uh, to the media uh, in this House as well. I, the City of Hamilton has failed its residents with regards to letting them know of the spill. We are making changes with the uh, Made in Ontario Environment Plan to ensure that uh, going forward, spillage across the entire province will be online and accessible. Uh, Mr. Speaker, and I have made comment the investigation is ongoing, and when that is complete, we will make the findings public. The supplementary question. So let's be clear, this was a devastating environmental disaster, and now, in a, ha a year and a half later, people deserve straight answers, not comments from the minister to the media. And this government's attempts to wash hands, their hands of the responsibility in all of this is simply appalling. The Premier himself shared his own opinions with the media when he said, and I quote, it's totally unfair what the councillors did and what the mayor did. Knowing this all along, you know they can't be dishonest with us. But his own minister knew for over a year and a half that sewage was flowing into our water and said nothing. Speaker, the people of Hamilton are looking for, for some accountability. Will the minister come clean, apologize for keeping Hamiltonians in the dark, and release the results of the investigation publicly? Minister. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Speaker. Unfortunately, the member opposite didn't. 
listen to my response. I said we would make the investigation public uh, once it's completed, and uh, we are making changes with regards to uh, how reporting is going forward. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, we've also made changes to uh, uh, the uh, the work that has to be done with the City of Hamilton going forward. So it's going to be very transparent and open process going forward, Mr. Speaker. And 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 I hope the member opposite works with us and supports us in our Made in Ontario Environment Plan to ensure that uh, we uh, we continue and make sure that we make it online reporting of any spillage across this province. We don't think. It's acceptable, especially when uh, councils such as Hamilton decide not to tell the people of their their area that, the fact that they've made a huge mistake with their with their sewage system. So, Mr. Speaker, um, you know we are going to work as hard as we can as mission Bonds. environment, ensure the cleanup continues, and ensure that it's made back to go back to how it was no, uh, originally before this village occurred. Thank you very much. The next question, the member from Mississauga Streetsville. Thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Many of my constituents were rightfully upset when news broke that a trustee with the Peel District School Board made a disparaging comment about McCrimmon Middle School in Brampton. And more concerns have been raised by families, students, the Peel District School Board Director of Education, the Board of Trustees, and members of the broader community. Allegations of anti-black racism, broader discrimination, and a lack of adherence to governance leadership and human resources practices at the board must be taken seriously. Mr. Speaker, our government took immediate action and recently launched a formal review of the Peel District School Board. Could the Minister of Education please tell the Legislature what this formal review will cover and how it will serve students and their families? Thank Questions you. to the Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Speaker, and I want to thank the member for her leadership in standing up for the families of Peel Region against discrimination. Speaker, we all agree that schools must be safe and respectful places for all students. It is clear, given the very serious allegations of anti-black racism, that the government had to intervene, which is why we took immediate steps to call in two reviewers to do that. Mr. Speaker, we've called in Anna Chada, who is also a, I should note, a Brampton resident, uh, is a, a leader in the South Asian community and is a human rights advocate, the former vice chair of the Ontario Human Rights Board. We, we appointed Suzanne Herbert, who is a former deputy minister, but also who was involved in the review of the York Region District School Board, who did a very similar review and very credible person. I have also deputized Patrick Case, my ADM for Education Equity, to lead to lead this process. Now, Patrick is a leader in Ontario's black community. He is a human rights advocate and a lawyer, and he Response. will lead this process and sit in each review to ensure the voices of the black community in Peel are heard. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to be clear. The Peel District School Board is home to one of the most diverse student populations in Canada, and it employs thousands of hardworking and dedicated professionals as educators, administrators and support staff. It is one of the utmost important to combat racism and ensure equity in our schools, not only in Peel District School Board, but right across Ontario. No student, educator or staff member should ever be victim to discriminatory comments or acts. Speaker, I know this is a value that every member of our government shares and that combating racism and ensuring the safety of our children are important priorities of our government. Could the Minister of Education tell this chamber why these priorities are so important? Great question. Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, obviously we stand with all members of this legislature opposing racism, particularly anti-black racism, sexism, homophobia, and any form of discrimination and prejudice that can manifest in class. Mr. Speaker, it is the priority of all members of this legislature to oppose it and denounce it, which is why when hearing about these serious allegations from students and parents and administration, we took immediate action to call into reviewers. In addition, I have deputized my Associate Deputy Minister Patrick Case, a leader in Ontario's black community and an advocate for human rights to sit in on every single review to lead that process and to ensure accountability for those that propagate it. Mr. Speaker, we are committed to ensuring children in Peel feel safe and feel respected in their classrooms. The next question, the member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Today is the International Day for People with Disabilities, and people with, living with disabilities in Ontario is getting harder for them. This is a crisis, but the actions of this government so far has been to include 
a cut in half of planned increases to the Ontario Disability Support Program and taking a billion dollars out of the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services. That has made life worse. We know that there are 16,000 people waiting for supportive housing in Ontario. We know that people with disabilities experience higher rates of homelessness, violence, food insecurity and poverty. We know that from the time children with disabilities are born to the time they grow old, Speaker, we're failing them. We're failing them right now. And we are failing their caregivers who suffer from ritual burnout right across this province. On this day, for the International Day of Persons with Disabilities, will this Premier keep making things worse? Or will he finally turn this around and start making life better for people with disabilities? The question is addressed to the Premier. Minister of Children and Community Social Services. Referred to the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Well, thanks very much. Uh, thanks to the member opposite for the question. It's very important, particularly on this day, but every day my ministry is working to ensure that we're improving supports for those living with disabilities, including all of the types of disabilities that the member opposite mentioned. Uh, when it comes to developmental disabilities, so we are uh, looking into how we are delivering uh, services to those in the DS sector, the developmental services sector, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that we get them what they need. Uh, the previous government for many, many years didn't improve support. Uh, for these individuals, and that's why we're taking an approach where we're looking across all of the different programs that are available. Uh, I've met with Oasis, uh, and I know the members opposite were with Oasis when they were here last week, and, and Community Living, and all those different uh, organizations. Spons. As a matter of fact, I had a great meeting on Friday with Terry Corkush in, in my own riding. She's the executive director of uh, Community Visions and Networking in the Quinty region. There are many different models out there. We're going to find the ones that work the best. Thank you very much. The member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. You know, the fact of the matter is there have been numerous studies and reports done. You have the Nowhere Turn report done by the Ombudsman. You have the Housing Task Force report that was put forward. You have the Deputy Premier who sat on a select committee and made recommendations about the crisis for people with, di with disabilities. It's time for you to actually act to help those people. Yeah. Yeah. On International Day for Persons with Disabilities, it is important to take stock of how we as a society support those living with a disability to lead full and happy lives. But the reality is living with a disability in Ontario is hard, and the government is not doing nearly enough to make life better for people living with disabilities. Wait times under the assisted device program, which helps people access things like hearing aids and wheelchairs, has ballooned to as much as six months under this Conservative government. And there is still no response to the Onley report or any plan for Ontario to achieve full accessibility by 2025. In fact, this government is going backwards when it comes to accessibility. When will this government put forward a real, comprehensive plan to improve the lives of people living with disabilities? The question has been referred to the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Uh, the Minister of Seniors and Accessibility. It's been referred to the Minister of Seniors and Accessibility. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member for raising that question. But first of all, I'd like to thank the Honourable David Orley once again in his work on the AODA review. The previous government had 14 years to improve the AODA. Mr. Only said in his report, they did so little. Mm. When I tabled Mr. Only's report, I was very pleased to announce that return of the health and education uh, SDCs, which was one of his recommendations. Right. The government knows that a lot of work needs to be done to make uh, Ontario accessible for everyone. Making Ontario accessible is a journey. This government will continue to take an all of government approach to tearing down sure. barriers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Everyone who has farmers in their riding knows the difficulties they face on a daily basis. Cattle farmers like the Fosters, dairy farmers like the Scoutons, poultry farmers like the Beckings, and lamb farmers like the Acres, all from the great riding of Carleton, and in fact, all farmers across Ontario feed Ontario's families. It's important that we support them. 
Unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, farmers in Carleton and across Ontario have felt more and more unsafe in their homes and workplaces, which oftentimes are the one and the same, due to frequent trespassing on their properties and their homes. Carleton's and Ontario's farmers want to know, what is our government doing about this, and will our government stand with them? Through you, Mr. Speaker, will the minister please tell us what action we are taking to help farmers struggling with trespass issues? Great question. Questions addressed to the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. And I want to thank the member from Carleton for that excellent question. Like her, we've heard these concerns from farmers, and I'm proud to say that we are taking action. We have proposed legislation which, if passed, would keep Ontario farmers, their families, agri-food workers and farm animals safe by reducing the likelihood of trespassing on farms and processing facilities. If passed, this legislation would deter trespassers by incurring fines of $15,000 on first offence and a maximum of $25,000 for subsequent offences. By ensuring that farmers are able to continue the great work that they do, that animals are kept safe and healthy, we are ensuring the integrity of our food supply. Mr. Speaker, our government stands with our farmers and remains committed to food safety. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response. Mr. Speaker, members in rural Ontario will have heard the concerns of farmers regarding this very issue. This was a big topic of conversation at one of my earlier Carleton Conversations public town hall meetings, and I'm encouraged by the fact that our government is taking action on this matter, and I'm glad that Bill 156, the Security from Trespass and Protecting Food Safety Act, has been put forward. People in rural Ontario are aware of the great lengths farmers go to to ensure that their livestock is taken care of and that they meet the appropriate biosecurity protocols in order to ensure the integrity of our food supply. Trespassers are often unaware of how their actions might impact these measures taken and inadvertently cause harm. So Question. through you, Mr. Speaker, will the minister tell us more about how this proposed legislation deals with this issue? Thank you. Minister to reply. Well, thanks, thanks again, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the member for the supplementary question. Our government understands that this legislation needs to strike the right balance. We respect the right of people to protest. We also are committed to animal safety and food safety. Farmers make every effort to ensure the integrity of our food supply by ensuring that their animals are not exposed to disease and distress. Unauthorized trespassers threaten this balance. Absolutely. The proposed legislation supports farmers in their efforts by creating animal protection zones on farms, processing facilities, and other prescribed premises. With our proposed legislation, we are ensuring that food safety is prioritized, while also ensuring animal safety and that farmers are able to continue the good work that they do, which all of us in Ontario benefit from. As we all saw from the farm community yesterday, which wildly supported this bill, we can rest assured that our government is doing just that. I'm and sure I again the thank the is. member for that question. The next question, the member for Oshawa. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, almost 100 residents of a few Oshawa apartment buildings found out this summer that their leases were being terminated because of renovations. They're being renovicted. These soon-to-be-displaced residents are seniors, working families, and folks on a fixed income. The housing situation in Oshawa is dire, and they don't know where they will go. My constituent, Angela, wrote to me, quote, The new owners are abusing the renovation loophole to evict tenants, offering large sums of money to people if they'll give up their right to come back. They state the units are in such a state of disrepair that renovations are necessary, when in reality all they're doing is updating and slapping some paint on the walls and relisting the units for double what we are currently paying. This is a cash grab. They know they can get more rent once we are gone." End quote. Speaker, every single Ontarian deserves a safe and affordable place to live. What is this government going to do to stop rent evictions and to help all of these people find a safe, affordable place to live? The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Speaker. And through you to the honourable member, I want to thank her for the question. I also want to thank her for uh, uh, attending our event yesterday in Oshawa, where we announced our latest innovation guide on tiny homes. Appreciated the opportunity to speak about uh, some of the issues in Oshawa with her and uh, Mayor Carter. 
Uh, in regard to uh, the issue that the members placed on the table, uh, our government uh, believes that uh, every Ontarian needs a place to call home, and as part of our uh, housing supply action plan, More Homes, More Choice, we consulted widely about a number of topics, uh, including uh, the issue of the Residential Tenancies Act. We heard from both landlords and tenants about the need for a fair system. Uh, as the member uh, uh, notes, um, the Attorney General and I have a shared responsibility when it comes Response. to the Residential Tenancies Act and the Landlord-Tenant Board. We are reviewing uh, the information that we've received as part of the consultation, and we'll be moving forward in the near future. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Again to the Minister. Each and every week, my office hears from people who are struggling to find a safe and affordable place to live. Minister, let me share some more from Angela's letter. Quote, the people in my building have been here for years, like Margaret in her late 80s on a pension, or Heather, a single mom on Ontario Works trying to raise her children while suffering from mental health issues and going to school. There are so many stories of really great people being forced out by greed. I'm going to try and fight them, but how can one little person win against a big, greedy corporation? How can they use this renovation loophole when really all they're doing is cosmetic work to hike up rents? Why are we not protected? Speaker, I have the same question as Angela for the minister. Minister, why are these renters not protected, and what are you going to do about it? Minister. Well, again, Speaker, uh, through you to the honourable member, we want to encourage a safe and fair system uh, for both uh, landlords and tenants. And as I mentioned in the previous question, we have consulted uh, broadly. Uh, we understand that it's important uh, for both tenants and landlords to be able to access hearings during a dispute, and I know that the Attorney General and I have worked very diligently to work with Tribunals Ontario to ensure that we have uh, uh, a number of more, uh, more adjudicators when it comes to the system. Again, we've, we've heard a number of suggestions. We're reviewing it. I understand the concern that the member has in her constituency. Uh, we share that concern. We want to ensure that the system is fair, that it is balanced. Uh, but in addition, uh, you know, I think the member needs to understand that we also have a housing supply crisis, and we need to have more purpose-built rentals uh, in this province. We've seen some great strides with some of the measures that we've done last year. We're going to continue to work with all parties. This is a big uh, uh, issue, Speaker. We need everyone working together. Thank you very much. That concludes question period for this morning. We have a deferred vote on the motion for second reading of Bill 116 an act to enact the Mental Health and Addictions Centre of Excellence Act 2019 and the Opioid Damages and Health Care Health Costs Recovery Act 2019. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bell.
and ask the members to please take their seats. On October 31, 2019, Mr. Tobolo moved second reading of Bill 116. All those in favour of the motion will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Tobolo. Mr. Tobolo. Mr. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Lecce. Mr. Lecce. Mr. Mulroney. Mr. Mulroney. Mr. Mulroney. Mr. Glenn. Mr. Kalani. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Ford. Mr. Ford. Ms. Elliott. Ms. Elliott. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Bethlehem Bob. Mr. Bethlehem Bob. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Smith Bay of Quincy. Mr. Smith Bay of Quincy. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Downey. Mr. Downey. Mr. Fullerton. Mr. Fullerton. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Sarkaria. Mr. Sarkaria. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Sermon. Mr. Sermon. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Mr. Cove. Mr. Cove. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Ms. Kanji. Ms. Kanji. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Mr. Gill. Mr. Gill. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Skelly. Mr. Skelly. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Miller, Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller, Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Ostrow. Mr. Ostrow. Mr. Tanny Gas. Mr. Tanny Gas. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Babb. Mr. Babb. Ms. Hoga. Ms. Hoga. Ms. Kusindova. Ms. Kusindova. Mrs. Tangri. Mrs. Tangri. Mrs. Wise. Mrs. Wise. Mrs. Kara Hollyus. Mrs. Kara Hollyus. Ms. Park. Ms. Park. Mr. Gazzetto. Mr. Gazzetto. Mr. Pang. Mr. Pang. Ms. Trianta Philopolis. Trianta Philopolis. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Standu. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Bauma. Mr. Bauma. Mr. Smith, Peterborough Quartha. Mr. Smith, Peterborough Quartha. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Cook. Mr. Cook. Mr. Sandy. Mr. Sandy. Ms. Gamari. Ms. Gamari. Mr. Kanapati. Kanapati. Mr. Babiki. Mr. Babiki. Mr. Sabawi. Mr. Sabawi. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Singh Brampton Center. Ms. Singh Brampton Center. Mr. Vanta. Mr. Vanta. Mr. Shubisong. Mr. Shubisong. Mr. Horvath. Mr. Horvath. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Satin. Ms. Satin. Ms. Shaw. Ms. Shaw. Mr. Mamakwa. Mr. Mamakwa. Ms. Begum. Ms. Begum. Mr. Yard. 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 Mr.